Thank you all so much. It's great to be back at Recite two years later. My, how this conference has grown. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about while you digest here. Some of you may remember this man. Hopefully it doesn't give you indigestion. Um, this is Donald Rumsfeld, co-architect of the Iraq War. Um, he'll be remembered for many, many things, um, but he did actually offer one piece of sort of intellect, one intellectual contribution that's really worth discussing here, and he offered it at a press conference, answer to a question on February 12, 2002, in the days following 9-11 and the run-up to the Iraq invasion when the Bush administration was searching for a reason, or a pretext to invade, and he was asked about weapons of mass destruction, why we had not found any yet, and this is his response. I'll go ahead and read it here. Reports that say that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me because as we know there are known knowns there are things we know we know and we also know there are known unknowns that is to say we know there are some things we do not know but there are also unknown unknowns the ones we don't know we don't know and if one looks throughout the history of our country and other free countries it is the latter category that tend to be the difficult ones in my business and writing we call this foreshadowing um, because, of course, this foreshadowed the various disasters of the Iraq War. Stuff happens, to quote another Rumsfeldism, um, but also the financial crisis of 2008 and the risk models that went awry. Um, the notion of unknown unknowns became repackaged as something else. Nassim Taleb, uh, the mathematician who wrote Fooled by Randomness, and, of course, the black swan. Uh, a black swan is sort of the ultimate unknown unknown, an unknown unknown that not only upsets uh, uh, your, your actual projections, but also overturns everything you think you knew. Um, and it's interesting to me that Taleb, after really writing about the risks posed by black swans, these events that can, that can uh, destroy everything we thought we hold dear, um, really turned to the notion of, you know, how do we prevent black swans? What is the antidote to them? And rather than try to predict things better, he actually responded to the notion of we should try to create things that are anti-fragile, that respond to shocks and recover from them. Basically, what he said was, uh, maximize the serendipity around you, was his prescription for black swans. And he calls these things anti-fragile. And what I think the most interesting about anti-fragility is, is that the most anti-fragile institution in Taleb's mind is the city. This is the man who's now writing actual essays around city-states and around why messy, chaotic, organic cities are actually the most anti-fragile institutions of all. Um, but I want to talk a bit about the sort of the fourth category, the one that Rumsfeld didn't mention in here, which I think is rel particularly relevant to the notion of the shared city, which is the unknown known, which is also the name of the documentary film about him. Um, how do we, what, what about the things that we don't know we know? What about the connections, the resources, the latent opportunities and possibilities that are buried in plain sight? Now, this is a question, how do we discover these things, that torments corporations, even in Silicon Valley. There's a famous saying there uh, about Hewlett-Packard, you know, the great corporation that actually is older than Silicon Valley itself, uh, that is now a, a shell of its former, former greatness. Um, if only HP knew what HP knows, one of its former CEOs said. If only it could understand exactly what was buried inside the skulls of its employees. And I'm going to talk a bit about, sort of, uh, as, as we progress to this talk, really what corporations are doing, and then cities, and then social networks, in an attempt to sort of engineer the serendipity. How do we basically share ourselves in various ways? How do we share our, our passions, our projects, our expertise? How do we find out who is actually around us at all times? I, I can assure you that somewhere in this room is someone you should be listening to more than me. There's somewhere within here, buried in all of these connections, new potential projects and opportunities for collaboration that we simply don't know about. And I've already had several people in my time here in Prague, I've been here for about 36 hours, tell me that Prague is a small town, that it's not a global city. Well, I still think that buried in that, you know, no matter how small it is, there are all sorts of latent potential connections, all sorts of ways of rewiring how the city works and how we know each other. And to me, it's a question of, can we actually do a better job through urban design and perhaps through technology of maximizing this sort of city. So I'm going to start with what companies do, because they're, of course, obsessed with this. And so we'll talk a bit about sort of the evolution of the office. Now, of course, you know, a particular sense, you know, that office buildings in, in most major cities, Prague is obviously different given its historic core, but if you look at a London or New York, we have filled the cores of our cities with skyscrapers, which are never more than 40% occupied at any given time. We have gigantic empty structures in the middle of our cities, and part of the reason is how we design them. We filled them with cubicles like this. This is from Jacques Tati's playtime. You know, the cubicle being sort of the, the ultimate uh, or the anti-anti-fragile in the sense of in a tiny, isolated places where people were expected to do paperwork. Um, it was a place where you were essentially a, a machine for doing paper. 
versus a place to discover your coworkers and ideas. And all that time when we had the cubicle, of course, there was an alternative tradition. This was Bell Labs in the 1940s, uh, where so many great inventions came from, you know, the laser, the transistor, effectively, uh, satellites, all these things that really define the second half of the 20th century. And there, AT&T did something very, very smart. It took a lot of diverse, smart people. It took theoretical physicists and metallurgists and put them in close quarters next to each other, the, density, the kind of urban density that we admire, uh, and then forced them all to go through narrow hallways so they would bump into each other so they could have actual conversations about the science. It basically tried to manage them by not managing them, uh, by allowing these sort of emergent outcomes to happen. And this is, of course, what MIT did famously. This is Building 20. Uh, this is where Noam Chomsky developed psycholinguistics and where all the sort of odds and ends of MIT were squeezed into one building. Uh, and my favorite aspect about this is they screwed up the numbering system so people frequently got lost just trying to find an office and would run into someone and have a more fortuitous conversation. And what I think was also interesting about Building 20 is that that building was built during World War II in 1944 to be a temporary wooden structure. It was never designed to last for the 50 years it lasted. Uh, and so researchers there felt free to basically play with the building as they saw fit. They would drill holes through walls, they would run wiring, they would knock things down, they would expand the various labs. They treated it uh, unlike, a, you know, in a non very irreverent way. And what's interesting about this is this is sort of a, a diagram from Frank Duffy uh, about sort of the notion that we know that buildings and cities alike don't evolve at the same speeds. That in fact, you know, the interior of them, the, the, the areas where we live and work and play the most are the ones that are rapidly changing all the time or should. Uh, and that we should separate infrastructure in a way from the areas in which we are actually moving, discovering, playing. Um, and so in the context of office space, basically Frank Duffy you know, described a, a, an office that evolved as quickly as the people within it, which of course we know is not the case. Most offices, you get one for 10 years and then you're forced to work against it. Um, and cities often fall into that problem as well. Um, but one of the earliest efforts to engineer serendipity, to try to capture the energies of Bell Labs and MIT then, was actually the building that replaced Building 20. This is the Stata Center at MIT, designed by Frank Gehry, which tried to incorporate all of these sort of informal freewheeling things, uh, putting whiteboards on mobile, on, on mobile spaces and all these sorts of things. And it sort of worked. Um, Stuart Brand, you know, who wrote the book How Buildings Learn, building off Duffy's ideas, famously called Stata Center an abortion. He thought it was a horrendous attempt to really capture what it was all about. And the reason I show it is because Frank Gehry is now very much in demand by Facebook and is now designing Silicon Valley offices, which are really the companies that have fully embraced the notion of engineering serendipity. This phrase, which sounds oxymoronic, is something I actually borrowed from a number of Silicon Valley panels. This notion of how can we accentuate the unfor unforeseen? How can we create our own black swans and our own anti-fragility? And so in Facebook's answer, they're trying to create an office that is becoming increasingly more like a city or has the energies of a city. So in this case, this is the, the, the largest uh, uh, Facebook office building in the world that, that just opened. Gary designed it to be, I believe it's a kilometer long and half a kilometer wide a single building under one roof, where Facebook basically can put all of its employees together and let them collide in various ways, and where all the desks are on casters, so they can move them and reconfigure them to try to capture all of this energy. And then the next step beyond that, of course, is what Google has tried to do in Silicon Valley as well. This is the uh, Bjarke Ingels Thomas Heatherwick proposal for the new Googleplex, which, you know, on the surface is very much about 1970s science fiction with its glassed-in domes. But what's interesting to me about this is the fact that they proposed that the, the campus itself could be reconfigured as the time went on. They would actually invent their own form of robots that would actually be able to move things around. They would decouple the systems, the underlying infrastructure, from the actual spaces. Um, this plan, of course, has been nixed by the local community board, and I think was slightly scared by it. Um, but someone is going to try to resurrect this, if not Google. Now, of course, the Silicon Valley companies, you know, they're interested in urbanism. They're trying to build these campuses that harness the energy of the cities, but only up to a point. I mean, there's still a campus. I love this guy. This guy's name is Max Lesson, or sorry, Sam Lesson. He's a former exec at Facebook. Uh, and he wrote an essay after he left the Facebook campus, now that he was working in San Francisco, how weird it was to be outside of the Facebook bubble. As he said, at Facebook, my meetings, the gym, and food were all within a one or two minute walk. Now my gym is a few minutes right away from where I'm working, and food requires leaving a building. These little bits of friction add up quickly. I love that this guy found that being in the real world was an actual inconvenience to him. Um, and of course, this is why Facebook and Google have invested so much in their campuses to try to keep people there at all times. So they have an idea, they have an inkling, they understand that the city is special, that there's something about it that, that is a step beyond them. Um, for example, the, there's an MIT social network uh, theorist named Cesar Hidalgo who's just published a book where he basically argues that in the end, all kinds of human organization are process information. They're giant in information processing machines. 
organizations, uh, which can function at an individual level or a team level or corporations. And Hidalgo recognizes that at a certain point, the company doesn't work anymore, that the next level up is the city, that cities have some aspect about that. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that one in a second. But it's interesting watching that there are some companies that have realized that instead of trying to mimic the city, they need to actually start blurring the office with the city. They need to actually start trying to harness its outside energies in or at least try to start breaking down the barriers between them. And so this is a space, workspace in, in Michigan called Grid70, where six local billion dollar companies, all in different industries, have moved their creative teams into the same space. And the reason is partly, and also a space that's in downtown Grand Rapids, that is walkable, it is urban, that is completely separate from their suburban headquarters. And part of the reason is they'll tell you it's to retain millennials, it's to keep talent, it's to create an urban campus. But the other reason is so they can learn faster from each other. Rather than having, the, having these people languish back on their suburban headquarters, why not put them all in the same space with, with, their, with their peers so they can learn faster from their peers? And so all of these companies have signed the requisite legal paperwork so they can share information, share research, share ideas around the water cooler or in the kitchen or in lunch meetings, wherever, in an attempt to basically see how fast they can learn. And to me, that's much more interesting in talking about these spaces than quote unquote innovation. Here's AT&T's The Foundry in Silicon Valley and Palo Alto, which tries to do a similar thing. Rather than talking about the billion dollar product, we hope we can invent when we're trying to create these avant-garde workspaces, what about creating places where we can simply learn faster in ways that can't be predicted by the formal org chart? And so that's what at and has done here. They actually have teams of their own along with some of their partners and some startups they bring in from the outside. And the idea is, is that by working together in close proximity and density, that perhaps we'll find a way to share, share ideas that can lead us to solve our problems. Um, and you know, the, the, the fullest expression of this in the workplace, obviously, is co-working now, which 10 years ago effectively didn't exist, or at least we had no way, we had no word for calling it that or really recognizing it. Now we have a co-working space off to the side here where, you know, furniture companies like Vitra are rushing to capture the phrase. Uh, and then you have some place like WeWork, you know, which has a $5 billion valuation and has 23,000 members worldwide, which is effectively WeWork has become a large corporation in terms of talent. But what's interesting is that, you know, is that people are, are agreeing to share space. So they're, they're sharing the city in the sense of sharing space. But there's a bigger definition here in which that they are sharing their talents. They're sharing their ideas with each other. And I think the next step beyond when it comes to workspace is going to be that someone enterprising is going to be WeWork or someone else where they're going to recognize that, you know, that these giant, this giant uh, uh, social network that WeWork has formed, it calls itself the physical social network, is something where you can start recombining all of these people. You can start putting together teams on the fly and creating a sort of new kind of, 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 of team and corporation. Um, and this is the sort of thing we're starting to see in the city where it really starts to blur in there. And so what is it about cities that are so special? Why is it that we see the Googles of the world trying to capture these urban energies? Well, a couple of years ago, a couple of physicists sat down and decided they were going to figure out how cities tick. Uh, and these physicists, Louis Betancourt and Jeffrey West and a couple other collaborators, did what physicists do. They went out and got a bunch of data, and then they plotted that data, and then they tried to write equations that would map to that data. And this is how we get the whole notion that cities get better as they get bigger, that cities seem there's something special about them in the sense that they are not machines, in the sense of Le Corbusier described them, and they're not organic beings, they're not they're not animals, they're not creatures in the sense that Patrick Geddes, the architect, thought about them either. They appear to be something else. They, you know, they don't follow the lifespan of getting, you know, they don't, they're not born, mature, plateau, and die like we do or corporations do. They, in theory, can live forever and, and theory can survive the ultimate shock, civil war, natural disasters, total resiliency. Um, and these physicists, being physicists, they turned to a different metaphor. They chose to compare cities to what they called social reactors basically like the sun or a star, only instead of combining you know, hydrogen atoms into helium and giving off heat and light, what you did in a city is you actually fused together the social networks that are all of latent possibilities that at various points, at various points in time and, and places, fuse at the edges and bring themselves closer together. And this is, of course, what lead to the dynamics that cities have done. And various other papers have explored this notion that it is the city's social networks that do this. And that really all of the infrastructure that we've talked about, all the sharingness of this, is really, and density, is really about how we can better bring these serendipitous fusions about. Uh, and so this to me is really interesting in the sense of, you know, uh, uh, now we're actually starting to see the next step where we're going to start to see people try to actually engineer better cities, try to engineer cities for serendipity. And of course, the first person who's really embraced this has, done about it, has gone about it in absolutely the wrong way. This is Tony Shea, who is the multimillionaire founder of Zappos, the shoe company, uh, who's based his company in downtown Las Vegas. He sold out his company to Amazon a couple years ago and took his fortune, $350 million, and announced he would build essentially a creative class company town. He would build a company town in the model of a Richard Florida or Edward Glazer. Uh, and so he set out to invest that in infrastructure. He built, you know, he bought 
a lot of land. He brought in a lot of startups from San Francisco. He invested it around. But what he really did was he actually created the sort of simulacrum of a city. He created a facsimile of what a city should be because he curated the whole thing. He wasn't really interested in the unplanned encounters that would come out of it. He basically created a model town that he controlled every sort of thing in it. Uh, and the results have not been quite a failure, but it's not really been a success either. And so I want to see if you want to design a city for serendipity, if you want to figure out how can we actually make a city burn brighter and hotter, to borrow our sun metaphor, I think we need to look at a place like this. This is Newcastle, Australia in 2008. Um, Newcastle is a former Rust Belt, it's a Rust Belt city in Australia, about 300,000 people. It's a couple hours north of Sydney, if you haven't been to it. I visited for the first time just this past March. Um, and this is what it looks like today after a project called Renew Newcastle set up there. Um, Renew was founded by an arts festival organizer named Marcus Westbury, who in 2008 tried to open a bar there and found that no one, despite the hundreds, literally hundreds of empty storefronts in its downtown, would, would let him lease a building. Like, they just simply refused. It wasn't worth their time because of the various administrative costs or tax write-offs. All the landlords found it more in their interest to actually keep these buildings empty than would be to sort of let it out, lease it out to just one person. And so Westbury figured out that the reason for this wasn't the fact that the buildings were too decrepit or it wasn't because there was a lack of entrepreneurs or artists or creatives in his town. It's because that somehow there was something holding the two apart. And so what he did was he went and actually hacked the regulatory framework. He created a new nonprofit called Renew Newcastle. And what Renew did was actually figure out a ways to make it really safe for landlords for people to use space on a temporary basis. So they don't sign leases, they use permits that he adapted from arts festivals, and so people can really use it uh, on a very short-term rolling basis of this. And over the last six years, you know, he's got over 173 projects and something like more like 75 spaces that were formerly empty, and many of them have gone on to actually sort of lease space from there. And so they filled up what was once a decaying downtown into this sort of whole active, whole active uh, uh, new CBD. And the whole point of Westbury's project in this, when we talk about serendipity, is a sense of he didn't try to decide what people would do. He simply tried to, to create, he tried to work in the cracks between the regulatory frameworks that were there and try to actually reduce the cost of, of experimentation. He tried to make it as simple as possible for someone who was running a business on their kitchen table or in their garage or their closet to actually move it downtown where people could see it, where people could see and be seen, and you could actually sort of meet people and share and collaborate to actually turn your project into a more shared project, into a more of a shared passion. And this is also what we're seeing in San Francisco. This is a project called Free Space I uh, want to talk about quickly. They signed a lease for a dollar for this building uh, and basically turned it into a site for community serendipity, where essentially anyone could come in and help program the building. Um, and so, you know, instead of, instead of a central authority doing it, people could basically come in, sign up, uh, and, you know, they have something like 120 projects and, and uh, events per month, you know, in a space that would normally have, you know, maybe a third of that. Um, and what's interesting, we talked to Mike Zuckerman about this. He talks about it in the same sort of sense he'd talk about Christiana and Copenhagen, the notion of a, of a free zone, of a, a temporary autonomous free zone, as Peter Hall once described it in London, a place where anything can go, a place where you can experiment where the costs are very low, and you can have all of, again, again, these sort of emergent encounters that come out of it. And what's really interesting about this to me is, I can share this bit of news, it might be premature, um, but they're in early talks with the city of San Francisco to take over a number of city-owned spaces to create more zones like this. So to work between a, a public nonprofit and the city itself, and, and again, that sort of top-down, bottom-up discussion we've been having today. Um, and so finally, with only a few minutes left, I want to talk about the network in this. Um, when we talk about sort of networked urbanism, we talk a lot about Airbnb and we talk a lot about sort of sharing space and sort of space as a service. Um, but I think the next frontier is really talking about, you know, how do we share each other? And if you want an early signal of this, online mobile dating is the place to go. This is where we share ourselves in public these days online. How many people here are using Tinder right now? Anyone? I never get any hands when I ask this. We have some people in the front. Come on, don't be shy here. It's Tinder. It's, it's totally mainstream now. But, you know, but to me, it's interesting with Tinder is, you know, when I met my wife in 2003, I met her when I crashed, a, I crashed a party and met her wandering around at a party. And what's interesting to me today is I never would have met her because all of the tools are in place for me to have stayed at the bar next door where I was supposed to meet friends and hung out on my phone and read Twitter. We've engineered incredible communication tools for global communication or global connections with people. I meet all sorts of people on Twitter that I then meet face to face at a later date. But we've, to date, we've built really poor tools for discovering the people who are around us and, and and the, and the passions that motivate them. Now, when it comes to dating, that's a really obvious one, and you can figure out if you're attracted. Tinder's a really simple interface. The next step up, I think, if we're looking for tools that we can build off of this is one called Hinge. Hinge is a mobile dating app that basically analyzes the social networks 
uh, around you on Facebook. So basically it recommends to you friends of friends through Facebook, people you don't know who are friends of your friends, the unknown knowns lurking of, in your Facebook feed. Uh, and then the next step, which I think is the most interesting, is Happen. This is a French app. Happen does sort of what Tinder does, but you have to pass through the same space as that person. It captures misconnections and then replays them to you at later dates and time. And so really what Happen does is it uses the city as both a filter and an encouragement for you to get out there and actually see it. And so I've been reading all sorts of interesting papers and talk to people who go through different neighborhoods of the city to discover the kinds of people they never would have met otherwise. So using the city as actually the friend who's recommending people to you. Uh, and these tools are only going to become more powerful. I'll, I'll move quickly through this now because we're running out of time. But, um, but you know, uh, for two weeks in April, I actually wore a badge around my neck called a sociometric badge that is a sensor package that recorded, who, that basically monitored and measured everyone I spoke to. It recorded our, rec not our conversations, but how we talked to each other. And basically, it could basically create a map of an, or of an organization. So we wore it at Fast Company, 20 of us. This is not the Fast Company map, but what it does is it generates maps like these, maps showing how people are actually connected, how they actually converse, not just how they're supposed to formally work. And so Alfredo Brillenborg was talking earlier about before we really had intervene in cities, we need to map them. Well, this is sort of what we can do with social networks. We can start to see how really we're connected, and then we can intervene to combine them. And this is just another quick example. This is a large health insurance company in the United States that's done this, where they map out the various groups that are not talking, and then they can intervene at a personal level. Level. They redesign the office, they come in, they do team building exercises, and they combine these networks together. Uh, and in a corporate context, it turns out that's really good for, for the shareholders, but the question is, what can we do for the city? And so just two final, two final provocations here. You know, again, we're seeing like, you know, we're starting to design these tools for the city itself. Coworking has proven to be an interesting one. This is a Seats to Meet out of the Netherlands. They've created a tool they originally called the Serendipity Machine, which was an attempt to build a digital overlay on their coworking spaces, which are free. The idea is you walk into their coworking space, and what you offer instead of cash is you offer your skills, your passions, what you're into, and sort of it clusters there in the cloud, and ideally you can try to connect, it will try to connect you with others who share the same things. This usually is, you know, based on JavaScript development. But we can start to expand our imaginations of this. This is a company that's about to launch in Oakland called Hilo, which is trying to do the same thing but for other community projects or any community of intention. You go onto it and you place what are called seeds, your, your passions, your interests, your potential projects, and then their software will try to match you to other people in the community. It'll try to turn these intentions into collaborations. And this is part of the tools, and I'm going to end here in just a second, that you know, we can see is joining the complement of other open data tools and, decision and, and, and collective decision-making tools that are starting to emerge. Um, Hilo is part of a group of tools that include uh, Lumio, which is being used by Podemos in Spain, to help drive community decision-making. So to me, this is part of, we're on the very cusp, or the very earliest stages of creating these sorts of tools that can start to identify all of these latent possibilities that surround us and start to activate it in cities and start bringing, bringing us together in different ways. And so I hope that should set the stage, not for this next panel, but for the discussion I'll be hosting in just a little bit about particularly open data and, uh, and other tools we can build. So thank you very much.